here are the, the disciples, all of them. Uh, they'd gone and spent time together after the ascension. And here they are gathered in one place. It says, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. Now, each one of these images uh, tells a story. The rush of a violent wind. Why a violent wind? Well, because in Isaiah 59, that is how the Lord promises that he will come. He will come as a violent wind. And it's after he has performed the act of atonement. He says he's so disturbed, the Lord says he's so disturbed by the lies and the violence that are going on, that he himself is going to take on the garment of atonement and come down and perform the act of requital. And then he will come to his children like the sound of like a rushing wind. So very, very clearly, that's what's happening here. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah. But after the act of the atonement, the coming of the rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Again, the word house. Of course, they were in a house. But do you remember at Ascension, as I told you about the vision of Jesus being lifted up? This was the vision of Isaiah 6, where, it's, where the Isaiah enters into the holy place and says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And then it says, and the house was filled with smoke. Here we're in the house. You see, that Isaiah vision, it's now three-dimensional. Part of being, living in the Spirit, is living within that temple vision of Isaiah. This is what's happening. The people here are being taken up into that temple vision. No longer the need for the temple. Now they are the temple. And that's actually shown again very beautifully. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them. Okay. So one of the things that had gone from the first temple was the fire. And here you can tell that it's the new temple that's being started because the fire has appeared. But what is it? that has appeared uh, to give them the fire. Divided tongues. It's very interesting, the word divided. Actually, it, it means more like apportioned out tongues. And it's referring back to our old friend Zechariah, who says, the spoil that was taken from you will be apportioned out to you. Referring precisely to the crucifixion. So here, in this new temple, the lot that was taken from them, Jesus, is being apportioned out to them. It is he himself. So Jesus himself, the, uh, the one who was killed, is now being given them as portions. And they are becoming those portions. The time is resting on each of them. So whereas in a temple, the priests after having sacrificed uh, the, the sheep or the lamb, um, they would then hold aloft some of the meteor portions burning. So the flames of fire might well refer to that. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. So here we have something interesting. This is the beginning of the undoing of Babel, where all people had been scattered. Now all people are being brought together in unity. And this is how it's described. The devout Jews from throughout the diaspora, all of whom spoke other languages, for whom Greek was probably the language they had in common, not Hebrew. They were, uh, they were in Jerusalem for the, the feasts, and they're suddenly hearing themselves spoken to as if in their own language. And it says... The text says, at this sound the crown gathered and was bewildered. Again, two wonderful little giveaway words. Because gathered is what, of course, um, uh, happened when the people tried to gather themselves together at uh, Babel, in the Tower of Babel. Tried to make themselves one so that they would all be united. Then it says in the, the book of uh, Genesis that God... Uh, God scattered them and confused them 
And that's where the word label comes from. It just means confusion. And the Greek word here is the crowd gathered and was confused. <laughs> Our translations, you know, cover over the fact that what this means is that here Babel is coming together and is now being undone. They are going to begin to discover that they are going to be able to speak all together independently of the languages. All the things by which we define ourselves over against each other are no longer going to matter because in fact the, the voice of the one who speaks in us as son is turning us into son and the new unity is being given. All this is happening before our eyes. Okay, so that's the, the Lucan picture. So many fulfillments, so much going on as what Jesus promised starts to make itself present. Now let's jump back to St. John's Gospel, which of course is the text for today. And is for me one of simply one of the most wonderful passages in the in the whole of Scripture. Um, remember where we are. This is in John's in John's Gospel. He doesn't give us the uh, fifty days between the Passover and the and, and Pentecost, which was the Jewish way of, of calculating those days. He gives us that same evening, the evening of the resurrection. He gives us Jesus appearing, not without some indication that there is a slight difference, uh, that there is an ascension that needed to be waited for. Remember, he has that conversation with Mary Magdalene, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended. But when he's ascended, meaning seated at the right hand of God, the whole of the act that he had come for completed, he is then able to share that with the disciples. So let's look at this passage. That evening on the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Again, it's this uh, sense of a, a parody, parody is the wrong word, but an undoing of the notion of the holy place in the temple where, of course, Jews were frightened to go in uh, as well they should be. No one was allowed in except the, the high priest, and the high priest only under um, extreme, um, with extreme precautions. But so here we have this inversion in an ordinary house where the disciples are hiding. <laughs> and guess what? This house turns into the holy place in the temple. Because Jesus came and stood among them and says, Peace be with you. In other words, the first thing to notice about them is they're frightened. They're frightened, they're ashamed, they've, they're kind of failures. They've been following someone who turned out to have been killed. Um, they don't know what's going on. They're hiding. The very first sign of the presence is peace. After this, he shows them his hands and his side, so he has to identify himself. How does he identify himself? He identifies himself as the crucified and risen victim, as the lamb standing as one slaughtered. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And that was what enabled them to understand that there was a, a wholeness going on, that it was the same person as the one that they lived with. And the second time he says, peace be with you. In other words, his whole appearance, this is the definitive theophany of the Most High in the whole of the scriptures and unlike all the others it's not frightening this is if you like the great shock of the New Testament that when God finally does turn up God is not frightening as the Father has sent me so I send you in other words you are now going to become part of the continuation of my work of opening up creation. When he had said this, he breathed into them. And I've changed the translation. The translation I said breathed on them. But it's the same verb as was used in Genesis when our Lord breathes into Adam's nostrils to give him life. Exactly the same verb. So it seems to me 
better that it be translated to breathe into here because that's what he's doing. He's creating the new Adam. And says to them, receive the Holy Spirit, which means strangely, now be insiders in the life of God. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And of course, alas, because we tend to be moralists and so on and so forth, uh, this has very easily become uh, a matter of you know, priests forgiving other people's sins and so on and so forth. It means so much more than that. This is the new creation we're talking about. What it means is that we are being invited to be insiders in God's opening up of creation, making it a much, much bigger, healthier space. And he's giving the power for this to happen to us. In other words, this is going to be a human endeavor now. He says, in as far as you open it up, in as far as you let go of the things that bind down and open it up, in other words, forgive sins, they will be forgiven. And as far as you don't, they won't. In other words, there's no uh, extra outside, you know, deus ex machina figure coming to sort things out. No, no, it's up to you. I have done the whole of this so as to make you insiders in the creative act of God as humans. With your intelligences, with your foibles, with your failures. But it's you who are going to be able to do this. This is uh, one of the most astounding things that anybody could possibly have heard. That God would turn up and say, Now be participators in the inside of my life, and you are going to be, if you like, its bearers. I want you to take charge of opening up creation. And please understand that uh, this is not creation in some, uh, let's say, historical sense, some sense of something that happened a long time ago. He's saying, no, that which is real that which is of God, that which is truthful. It's actually reality we're talking about. You are opening up reality. You're going to be conscious participants on the inside of opening up reality. And this is going to be a human-centered exercise. See, that's what I find astounding about this. We think of the Holy Spirit. We listen to the uh, imagery from uh, Luke. We read the passage here, and the sense that we are being with something incredibly gentle, a breath into us. Of course, you're welcome to the, the more pictorial uh, uh, imagery of Luke. But ultimately, it's the same thing, this incredible gentle breath within us, which turns us into insiders into the life of God and means that at this very, very intimate personal level we are being invited as an act of extreme gentleness intimate gentleness to be co-discoverers of the real the true, the just what actually the life of God is really like the life of God and reality, everything that is real. It is the creator spirit who is making us as part of reality open up part of reality. So much going on here. I just wanted to leave you with this sense of this act of intimate trust that we've been invited to take part in. And as we sit with this to discover what it is to be living inside this new in-between, this life in which we are being made together intimate participants, sharers, builders up of each other, openers, openers up of life for each other. What's that going to look like? That, I hope and pray, is what we're going to discover in the weeks ahead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.